everybody. Um, my name is Beth Brosnan, and I'm a member of the We the People Lecture Series Committee. And we are just beyond thrilled um, that you're here tonight for the opening event in our 2013-2014 series. Um, I'm thrilled it's such a big crowd. We do have seats around here. If you're having trouble finding one, if somebody sitting next to an empty seat can just shoot their arm up and help out a little. We the People was founded about eight years ago by members of the Congregational Church, the Episcopal Church, and the Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, all of Exeter, and we did this in happy association with Phillips Exeter Academy and Water Street Bookstore. And the mission of We the People is to explore issues at the intersection of current events, religion, and ethics. Um, I'd like to say just a quick word about one of our co-founders, a wonderful man named Donald Cole, who passed away earlier this month. Um, some, maybe many of you knew Don. He was a long time, much respected um, history instructor and senior administrator at Phillips Exeter. And Don's uh, intelligence, his energy, and his public spiritedness really help guide the work that We the People does. And he will be missed by many people in town. to give you a quick preview of coming attractions um, next Monday night, 7 o'clock, October 28th, right here in the Congregational Church, we're going to be holding a panel discussion on climate change. But this is a discussion with a difference. Um, our panel will feature two clergy members and two scientists from UNH. And together they are going to be wrestling with um, a faith response to climate change. We hope you will come and be part of that conversation, so please save the date and meet us back here on Monday night. All right. So now I'd like to talk about tonight and how special tonight is. And of course, one of the reasons it's special is it is the first night of the World Series for our beloved Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> but the game doesn't get underway, underway until a little bit after eight o'clock tonight so you know for the next 90 or so minutes we can all just send good vibes down to Fenway and knowing that you know after nine we'll be home we'll be sitting in front of the television set it'll be the second inning yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> and we can cheer on the Red Sox versus the Cardinals but right now we get to cheer on a different kind of a heavy hitter. Um, I think really one of America's preeminent journalists. And I, I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that our guest, Hedrick Smith, is the David Ortiz and, <laughs> and the Shane, help me out, Victorino, of American journalism. Um, when it comes to the big stories and the big issues of our time, Hedrick Smith can swing for the fences. So, um, over the five decades of his career, um, first with the New York Times and then with PBS, Hedrick Smith has reported on everything. Everything. By everything I mean the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union, the rise of terrorism, um, education reform, the state of health care in America. Oh, and Duke Ellington and Dave Brubeck? Yeah. That's an extremely partial list of the subjects that, that Hedrick Smith has tackled. Um, and during that time, he's won not one, but two Pulitzer Prizes. The first is part of a team at the New York Times for their work on the Pentagon Papers. And the second, uh, for international reporting, for his work as Moscow bureau chief with the New York Times. His frontline documentaries have won two Emmys, and his books, The Russians and The Power Game, How Washington Works, were both huge and hugely influential bestsellers. So we've all benefited many times over from the breadth, breadth of Hedrick Smith's um, experience and his curiosity, and from the depth of his research and reporting. 
And I think we are particularly lucky that he's devoted the last several years to exploring an issue that many of us are living out on a daily basis. And that's a rise in income inequality in America and a decline in the fortunes of, the, of our middle class. Um, he's produced a book, a wonderful book, a riveting book, a very readable book, um, which examines the structural causes, both political and economic, that underlie these changes, and many of them going back decades. But he also looks ahead and suggests how we can replace our current state of constant conflict with a renewed sense of common purpose. I'm basically stealing his words here. Common purpose and a commitment to the common welfare. So lucky us, tonight, Hedrick Smith is here to talk to us about his book, and then we'll open the floor up for maybe 30 to 40 minutes of questions. And then following the talk, thanks to our partners, Water Street Bookstore, we have many copies of Who Stole the American Dream here, and Hedrick Smith has agreed to hang around to sign books, to meet with you, and talk with you. Let's get the party started. Ladies and gentlemen, Hedrick Smith. Thank you, Beth, uh, for that kind introduction. My mother would be absolutely delighted. <laughs> uh, and thank you all for being here. I, I know, looking around, at least a lot of the men in the audience, and probably some of the women too, it's a tough moment. I'll do my best to get all the guts of this thing out before at least the end of the first inning. And with the quality of pitching in the major leagues today, there really isn't a heck of a lot that happens in the first inning. You get to see, you get to see how many pitches the the pitcher throws in the first inning, and how that means how many innings they're going to hang around in the ball game. But really, it's not until the second or third inning typically that things happen. I happen to be a Detroit Tigers fan, so I've been watching the Red Sox very closely, uh, and they're a great team, and I wish them well. Let me tell you what a special evening this is for me. As a longtime New York Times correspondent, of course, I'm not a stranger to New Hampshire. Uh, several presidential elections brought me up here. But what brings me here tonight in Exeter, I need to tell you, is not just you wonderful people here, and not just we the people, but three people in the audience who are here tonight, and I wish they would stand and you'd welcome them. My daughter, Leslie Dixon, and her husband, Jeff Dixon, and my great-grandson, uh, and they're here not because they're traveling with me, but because I'm spending the night in their home on 23 Brentwood Road, right here in Exeter. So they're from Exeter, and my daughter went to, and Jeff went to New Hampshire College, which has now been, I discovered this week, you never told me, South New Hampshire, Southern New Hampshire, Southern New Hampshire University which I've now found out. They both went there and then Leslie went on and got an MBA from UNH. So, and I was just at UNH this afternoon, Leslie met me up there. So I'm feeling uh, thrilled myself and, and very much at home to be here. Uh, and I wish I could continue in this light, merry vein. Uh, but, well, I will for a moment. When you think about the predicament America is in today, and I don't mean just the 16-day government showdown and the polarization in Congress and the dysfunction of our political system, all of which we need to think about and talk about. Uh, I mean the much longer problem that has been developing in this country, of the enormous inequality of income and, and the influence of money in our political system and the influence of gerrymandering, uh, which has created some of the polarization that exists in our political system. Uh, and as I think about it, the lighthearted way of describing it is to recall that, that one of my favorite cartoons from Peanuts, you know, the Charlie Brown cartoon strip, it's the one where Lucy is in the backyard and she set up a card table that says psychiatry, one cent. Well, you know who comes up, inevitably, Charlie, of course. Charlie puts his penny down and he starts to ask Lucy for advice and a little bit of mental health treatment. And she says, Charlie, before I can give you any advice, she said, I need to ask you a question. You need to think of life as a voyage on a great ocean liner. Now there is one group of people and they take their deck chairs and they take them up into the bow and they look into the future to see where they're going. And there's another group of people and they take their deck chairs to the stern and they look back to see where they've come from. <coughs> Which group do you belong to, Charlie? He scratched his head for a minute, paw on his feet in the dirt. He said, Lucy, I'm having trouble getting my chair unfolded. <laughs> 
That is one way of looking at Congress today. They're having trouble getting in their chair up. Right? Um, the more serious way of looking at things is to recall a comment really marvelously articulate uh, and elegantly phrased of John Gardner, who was the founder of Common Cause and the Health Education and Welfare Secretary in Lyndon Johnson's cabinet. Gardner died a few years ago, but before he died, and think of this, he said this in about 2004. So this is before the collapse, right? Before Wall Street went down the tubes in 2008. What he said was this, we are treading the edge of a precipice here. Civilizations die of disenchantment. If enough people doubt their society, the whole venture falls apart. If enough people doubt their society, the whole venture falls apart. We must never let anger, fashionable cynicism, or political partisanship blur our vision on that point. We must not despair of the republic. I believe that's where we are. I believe we're in really, really serious shape in this country. Uh, and I think the evidence has been building for a long time. As a journalist for a long time, I think uh, myself and my colleagues, we did not do you well. We did not let you know exactly how bad it was. We've, we've gotten ourselves into the intricacies of the immediate battles without looking at the change in the landscape of America and describing it and connecting the dots for you and for ourselves so that we all understand where we've been. We're not gonna get out of the ditch we're in unless we understand how we got into it. At least that's my belief. Now I began, this is a reporter's book, it began with questions. It did not begin with the title it now has, Who Stole the American Dream. It began with the title, The Dream at Risk, because in 2009, when I began my work, all I knew was that there were a heck of a lot of problems. We were losing 500,000 jobs a month. Millions of people were being foreclosed out of their homes. The economy was, uh, was headed for, the, for over the cliff, and Wall Street had already collapsed. It didn't take anybody, it didn't take an act of genius to understand that the dream, or the American dream was at risk. The question was why, the question was how did we get here, where were we before, and was it really much better before? You know, it's interesting. Uh, my mind flashed back during the time I was doing research on this book, and I need to tell you it took me two and a half years to write this book. I did a whole year of reporting and research without writing a word for the book. Notes, yes, but no writing of the book. And during that research, I was reminded that at Oxford, after I finished Williams College, I had studied that great British historian Arnold Toynbee, who wrote a 12-volume history of the 21 civilizations of the world over 6,000 years called A Study of History. I need to confess right off the bat, I did not read all 12 volumes. I only read two volumes, which were a summary, an abridged summary, and those were 1,200 pages long, and they were thick, and they were heavy going. But what's interesting is, and what I remembered and retained and went back and looked into, was Toynbee's brilliant analysis that the history of civilizations throughout all that time, throughout all those six millennia of human history, was a story of challenge and response. Civilizations are challenged in some way, and their ability to survive and thrive and carry on depends on the response they make to the challenges that they face. Now, he starts out with ancient Egypt, and believe it or not, the challenge he identifies first for ancient Egypt is an environmental challenge, a hostile environment. So the challenge was for the Egyptian people at that time, several thousand years ago, to be able to establish a workable agricultural economy and society that would support a large civilization, which after all went on and built those wonderful temples at Hatshepsut and the pyramids and so forth, which are evidence of a fairly substantial society. And he also looked at the Inca, a civilization in Peru. And the same thing is true. A hostile environment, they overcame it, and look what they left at Machu Picchu and at other places. But both of those civilizations were attacked centuries later by superior military forces. In the case of the Egyptians, the Ottoman Turks, who conquered Egypt in the 19th century, and the Spanish, who conquered Peru and Latin America much earlier than that. So there are two kinds of challenges, both external, a military challenge and an environmental challenge. And often there are territorial challenges between civilizations. Um, those are challenges that we're familiar with. We faced the challenge in World War II of Hitler and Nazi Germany allied with Italy and then of course Pearl Harbor and Japan and the attack at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. 
We dealt with that challenge. We summoned America, made it an arsenal for democracy, and overcame that threat with our industrial might. And then we faced a second challenge, a global challenge from Soviet communism, from another power which became a thermonuclear power as we were, and which challenged our, 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 us on their ideological grounds, and also all around the, the world, in Vietnam, in the Congo, and so forth. And that too was a challenge that we met, an external challenge. But what's interesting is when Toyn begins talking about the civilizations that mean the most to us, that we think about, that we design some of our architecture around uh, in Washington and even in places like Exeter, New Hampshire, it's Greece, Greece and Rome, ancient Greece and Rome. Now what's interesting about ancient Greece and Rome and what's relevant to America today is that the challenge that proved ultimately fatal to them was an internal challenge. The Greek city-states fell to war among themselves over international commerce and they collapsed from within and they were taken over by the Roman civilization and the Hellenic civilization. And Rome too fell victim to those internal fights. Uh, we know what Caesar being killed by Brutus and then Caesar's being fought by Pompey and it goes on and on until you finally have a breakdown in the center of this great empire that is Rome. Toynbee calls the problems of such civilizations schisms in the body social or schisms in the soul of the society. Think about that. We are today in America a divided society. We're divided by money, we're divided by power, and we're increasingly divided by schisms in the soul of our society. So the history that he's talking about and the warning that he's giving us as he writes that history is very relevant to us today. And then there was that fellow, Abraham Lincoln, who said a house divided cannot stand. So think about where we are and what we need to heal. That's a backdrop to the to things that I want to talk about and lay out for you today. So my book actually begins with Toynbee, and then it wanders through the Middle West and talks to Pam Scholl and, uh, and, and uh, Mike Hughes, who got jobs in the 1970s when they came out of high school and had very successful middle-class careers for 35 years, and then their plant shut down. And I won't tell you their story since then, but their lives have unraveled, you can imagine. And I tell the story about Pat O'Neill, who was a jet airline mechanic for United Airlines. He worked there for, again, about 35, 40 years, and then got ready to retire. And just as he retired, United Airlines declared bankruptcy. And uh, he put $80,000 of his hard-earned earn savings into the employee stock option program for United Airlines overnight, worth zero. His 401k plan collapsed. Uh, the market went down, of course, 2001, 2003, came back up a bit, and then it went down again in 2007, 8, 9. The, his 401k, which he contributed to conscientiously, was worth half as much as it was before. And then his retirement program was turned over by United Airlines to the PBGC, the government entity that, that t takes bankrupt companies, the retirement programs, and their formula for retirement uh, took $1,000 a month from his retirement. Mike uh, Pat O'Neill could not afford to retire. He had to go back to work. He, and, and this was in 2003 that he retired. He's now 70 years old, 2013. He cannot see the time when he's gonna be able to afford to retire. So when I'm talking to you about some numbers, as I'm going to, just remember the numbers are the front for people. These are people's lives. Some of them we know, an awful lot of them people like us looking around this audience. This is a pretty, pretty comfortable audience, pretty well-educated audience living in a very prosperous and nice community. There are lots of things about people's lives in America that we don't know about because we don't live, we don't walk in their shoes. We don't walk in the shoes of the, of the millions of people who are now working in fast food uh, uh, places uh, and they make the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Most of them don't get work more than 30 hours a week. Do the arithmetic, that's $210 or thereabouts a week. That's $10,000 a year. Those are poverty wages. Those people need food stamps. They can't even buy enough food, let alone health care and the kind of housing they can put over their heads. And these people are working. These are not moochers. These are not leaning on the society. These are people who want more work and want to make more money. So we gotta remember we got millions of people in America who are in that kind of shape. I just saw the unemployment figures. We all focus on the numbers, 7.3%, 7.4%. The fact is there are 21.5 million people in America today who want full-time work and cannot get it. 
They're either unemployed and looking for work, that's 10 or 11 million of them. There are another 4 million or so that have dropped out. They've been unemployed so long they've given up. And there are another 8 million or so who have part-time work and want full-time work and can't get it. So we've got an economy that isn't working for those folks. And at the same time, we have an economy in which Citibank, this is not Paul Krugman, <laughs> Nobel Prize winning economist from Princeton, or Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist from Columbia, who's talking, writing books about the price of inequality. This is Citibank in 2005, put out a brochure for its most wealthy clients and said the best place to invest your money is in companies that are producing for the richest people in America, the top one or two percent, because so much purchasing power is concentrated in the hands of that group of people. They called America a plutonomy. We know a plutocracy is a, a, a system of government which is ruled by the elite at the top. A plutonomy is a, an economy that's run by the elite, for the elite. In fact, Stiglitz at the head of one of his articles said, an economy of the 1%, for the one, by the 1%, for the 1%. We don't want to say, shall it perish from this earth, which is what Lincoln said about democracy um, in the Gettysburg Address. Citigroup went on to say that the inequality of income that we see in America today is the greatest inequality of income that the world has seen in a major economic power since 16th century Spain. Since 16th century Spain. Since 16th century Spain, go away with that. Remember that, it's really important. It is astonishing. From 1979 to 2011, out of the entire growth of income for the entire country, 84% of it, five sixths of it, went to the top 1% of the population. From 2000 to 2007, 100% of the growth of the nation's income went to the top 1%. He said, what about the rest of us? The rest of us, on average, stayed right where we were. In fact, if you look at the average income of the average male worker in 2011, it was adjusted for inflation. It was exactly the same in 2011 as it was in 1978. Dead even, no progress for three decades an enormous amount of wealth going to the top. Now we've got, I think that is the most serious problem that we have in America today, the high concentration of wealth and the stagnation of the living standards of the middle class Americans. People are in very bad shape, particularly when they're dealing with uh, the big ticket items that are tough for families to deal with. If, if incomes adjusted for inflation are dead even, then you can say, well, the cost of living, the cost of food, the cost of gas, the cost of normal expenses, they've kept up with that. It's true. But the cost of health care has skyrocketed way beyond the normal cost of inflation. The cost of college education has skyrocketed way beyond that, and the cost of housing has gone up way beyond that. So the average family, when it's facing those big ticket items, simply can't handle it and all kinds of consequences flow from that. So I, I was looking at these facts and, and listening to the stories of Pam Scholl and Mike Hughes and Pat O'Neill and lots of other people and saying, you know, I don't remember it being this way when I came out of Williams College in the middle 50s and served my three years in the Air Force and then did a year of graduate study at Oxford University and so forth. I don't remember it being this way, but I've got a lot of white hair and people with white hair have a tendency to remember things in the old days as being a lot rosier than in fact they really were. So I thought I'd better go back and check and see whether or not in fact what I'm remembering, this widely shared prosperity was in fact the case. Well, when I got back there, I found some very interesting things. If you look at the rise in the productivity of the American workforce from the end of World War II until the middle 70s, it virtually doubled. It rose 97%. And if you look at the median household income, the income of the people right in the absolute middle of American society, it rose 95%. 97% increase in productivity, 95% increase in the average standard of living. Dollar for dollar, the growth of the economy, the efficiency of the economy, the profits of American corporations were being passed through to everybody. Now, economists like to break the population down and analyze it in terms of quintiles, the top 20%, second 20%, so on down, bottom 20%. When they go back and look at this period, what they find out, 
and the graphs show it. The, every single one of the quintiles showed fairly comparable growth in income over that 30-year period, all the way down, up and down the line. In fact, the fourth and fifth quintiles, the bottom two quintiles, showed more percentage gain in average income growth than the, uh, the rest of them. And the one at the top actually showed slower income growth than the rest of them. So over that period, we had a slight convergence, not much, a slight convergence in incomes from the middle, from, sorry, from the top to the middle to the bottom. This is not to say we didn't have inequality of income. Charlie Wilson, who ran General Motors, made 35 or 40 times as much as the average worker at General Motors. And that was fairly typical among the, the equivalent of Fortune 500 companies at that time. So there was inequality. Charlie Wilson's interesting. Charlie Wilson made $600,000 a year. Translated into modern economics, today he would make $5 million a year. $5 million a year? You could be the head of 7-Eleven for $5 million a year in the American economy today. If, if a, a CEO, a CEO like Blank Flynn at Goldman Sachs and Michael Eisner at Disney and Sandy Wall at Citigroup, if you weren't making 100 or $200 million, you were a piker. Okay, so that tells you something has gone out of whack between Charlie Wilson. He was running the largest corporation in America, the most important business in America. Things are out of whack. And I told you before, the average person, the average male is not making uh, anything more today in inflation-adjusted terms. So what was going on back there? Why was Charlie Wilson not making more money? And why were the average people doing as well? And why were all those quintiles moving up together? Well, I came to the conclusion after doing a lot of research and, and interviewing people and reading books that there were really two things at work that were really important. One was that we had a very politically activist middle class in America during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. If I say to you the civil rights movement, it'll ring a bell. Martin Luther King, the freedom riots, sit-ins, all that kind of stuff. It's the 1960s, where Negroes in America are pushing for more rights. They weren't particularly economic rights, although in the end, Martin Luther King was really demonstrating for jobs, as well as for the right to vote and the right to eat at lunch counters and so forth. There was a women's movement. 50 years ago, Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique. Women said it was unfair that they should make 41 cents on a dollar for the same work that men were doing. And they demonstrated, and they went brawless. They did all kinds of things to tell people, this is wrong and we're protesting it. We want you to know about it, and we're gonna be in your faces about it until it changes. In 1963, 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy signed one of the first pieces of legislation to try to move us towards more equality and income between the genders. We're not there yet. Women are still making only 70 cents on the dollar for men, but that's a lot better than 41 cents. But the point was, they were out there agitating, aggravated, pushing us, and, and, and moving the society. There was a consumer's movement. Ralph Nader wrote a famous book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and he said Detroit is producing cars that are causing accidents. The brakes don't work, something's wrong with the axles, the wheels come off, a car, the tires explode, something goes wrong, we've got to fix it. Business is producing stuff that's not working for people. And by the way, the pharmaceutical companies are not mm, producing drugs that are exactly safe. So we got to put more heat on the Food and Drug Administration to check drugs and more pressure on the Department of Agriculture to inspect meat and poultry. A whole lot of things. If you go into a store today and you pick up a product and you turn it over on the back, as I'm sure at least half of this audience does, and maybe better than half of this audience does, if you look at the contents, you can thank those people in the consumers movement in the 1960s and 70s because they were the ones who insisted that products be fairly labeled. Also that the packaging be fair, that you didn't have a huge package for a tiny little, remember candy bars? My God, there was a moment when the candy bar packages got enormous and the Heath bar kept shrinking and the Mounds bar kept shrinking and the package got bigger. You know? And they said, wait a second, that's not fair, that's dishonest, let's make it more honest. So there's a consumers movement and they have an impact. There's a labor movement that's very powerful. And they're negotiating with U.S. Steel or, or General Motors or General Electric, and they're saying, you know, we're going to sign a contract. You don't want to have any strikes. Gen Charlie Wilson at, at General Motors in 1948 said, we don't want any more strikes. Let's get back to making cars and making money. And Walter Ruther at the United Auto Workers said, okay, Mr. Wilson, we'll do that. But we want five-year agreement. We want a two or three percent pay raise each year. We would like a health benefit. They already had some. We'd like a health benefit. We'd like a lifetime pension of some kind. 
It was the first, it called the Treaty of Detroit, actually. It became a model uh, for the rest of the auto industry, for the steel industry, and actually it became a model for many non-union plants all across the country. There were millions of non-union workers that benefited from the social compact that was negotiated basically between the United Auto Workers and General Motors. So we had that going on. Uh, and people ask me at times, what do you mean when you say the American dream? Do you mean the Horatio Alger dream, I can go from the bottom to the top? Do you mean the immigrant's dream, I can come from Greece or, or Vietnam or Mexico or Central America and come to America and do better? Or do you mean something else? I mean the middle class dream. The middle class dream in the 50s and 60s and 70s was a steady job, rising income through your lifetime, not dramatic for most people, but rising income, assuming that your skills got better uh, and your talents were worth something more and your experience was worth something more to your employer, a health benefit and a lifetime pension. Do you know that in 1980, which is not so long ago, and looking around this room, there may be some people in this room who can remember that as well as me, 84% of the people, <coughs> excuse me, 84% of the people who worked for companies of more than 100 employees had guaranteed lifetime pensions from their employers. A check from the day you retired till the day you died, a monthly check from your employer. Today that number is 30%. And the only reason is it's 30% because there's still so many old guys around, but as they die off, that number is going to keep going down. And 70% of those workers had fully paid employer health insurance. And today that number is 18%. So that's what underpinned the dream of the middle class. Steady job, those benefits, enough money to make a down payment on your home and pay for 30 years, pay off your mortgage, own your home. So in retirement, you had a castle of your own, you had a place you could retreat to. Maybe you sold it and went to Florida, but you could buy another one, maybe for less. So that's what you had and you had the hope that your kids would be better. That's the dream that I'm talking about. And that's the dream that millions of Americans enjoyed. And they enjoyed it largely because there was an aggressive engagement of average Americans in all these movements. And add to that the environmental movement and add to that uh, the, the peace movement on the Vietnam War. People demanded something. I remember talking to Bill Ruckelshaus at one point about the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, you know, there was a demonstration on Earth Day in uh, 1970. Do you know how many people in America went and demonstrated? There probably people in this room had demonstrated. A show of hands. How many people? Yeah, look at this. Okay. 20 million Americans demonstrated on Earth Day, 1970, with nearly 10% of the population of the country. They were either out on the streets or on college campuses or on shopping malls or on radio or on television, talkathons, you name it. Within a year, within one year, Congress passed seven major pieces of environmental legislation. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Anti-Toxic Substance Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, three or four more. And they were all signed by that great environmentalist Richard Nixon. <laughs> so I said to Ruckel's house, Bill Ruckel's house, who was the first head of EPA, I said, tell me about Nixon. I, I did a documentary several years ago for Frontline called Poison Waters about Chesapeake Bay and Puget Sound. <laughs> I, and I, so I was interviewing Ruckel's house. I said, did Nixon really believe in that stuff? Or what, what about Nixon? Uh, what, he said, in all the years I worked for Nixon, he said he never once asked me, Bill, is it really bad out there? If you put your arm in the Potomac River, is it true? When you pull it out, it's going to be covered with green slime from the algae that, that pollutes the, uh, the Potomac River? He said, never asked me. He said, but he did say one thing to me. He said, Bill, when you get over there, don't let those bureaucrats at EPA capture you. Epa. <laughs> Ruckus House said, Ruckus House said that Richard Nixon was the only person in Washington who thought the nickname for the EPA, the agency which he himself established, was Epa. I mean, Ruckus House couldn't get over laughing at that. But as I said, so why did he do it? He said Nixon was a practical politician. He said the people demanded it. We had to respond. That's how democracy is supposed to work. Now, if you took high school and college history when I did, that sounds normal. But if you're watching politics today, the idea that the people demanded it and Washington responds and that's how democracy works, it sounds like you're describing another country. It certainly doesn't sound like you're describing America, right? Sadly. Anyway, so we had these powerful movements and at the same time we had something very interesting. And one of the people who's here tonight, it, it particularly pleases me, it's a woman who teaches ethics uh, and business and, and philosophy at Exeter. And one of the interesting things to me is the change in the ethics of business leaders in America. 
in terms of their concept of how companies should be run. If you go back and read the writings of uh, Charlie Wilson at GM, or Reg Jones at General Electric, or Frank Abrams at Standard Oil in New Jersey, or Peter Drucker, who at that point was the guru of business professors, came from Claremont College in, in, in California, and wrote a zillion books, and he lectured everywhere. What they said was, it was the responsibility, in fact, they used the term, it was the sacred trust of the CEO of a company to support and balance the interests of all the parties that had a stake in the, in the corporation and its success, the stakeholders. We had in America at that time what economists now call stakeholder capitalism. These guys all believed it was good economics and smart business to pay middle class workers and their employees well because it would help drive the economy. Economists call that the virtuous circle of growth. And it's important, it's a circle, because each part of the process pushes the next part of the process and keeps the process going. It was the engine of growth in America during that long post-war period. And what the idea is, if you have a lot of people, a lot of companies, paying tens of millions of workers well, middle-class Americans do not save a lot of money. They spend it, right? People at the top may save a lot, but people in the middle, they spend it. They're 95%, 96%, 102%, whatever, but at least 95%. That is what drives the growth in the economy. That steady, powerful, robust consumer demand which forces automakers and cell phone makers and refrigerator makers and, and uh, microwave oven makers and on and on and on, sock makers and jacket makers, or whatever, all through the economy to increase production, to hire more people, to buy more equipment, build more plants. That was the magic that made it grow. And we've broken that cycle. I'm going to get to that. We've broken that cycle because if you don't pay people well enough, there's not enough demand. And if you look at the weakness of the American economy today, its great failure is inadequate demand. It's not inadequate capital. The idea that the job creators are the people at the top of the pyramid, we've got to give them lower tax rates so they'll put money aside so we can build new factories. We're not short of capital. Business for the last four or five years has been sitting on at least two trillion dollars of accumulated cash capital. And most years of the last two or three years, they've spent $500 billion a year buying back stock of their own company in order to jack up the price of the stock. Because they don't know what else to do with their economy because the demand is not certain enough. The middle class push, the push of the virtuous circle of growth is not working in the American economy. In fact, it's gotten worse with each recovery. If you go back to the period prior to, to, to 1990, it typically took the American economy between 18 and 20 months to go from the bottom of the business cycle back up to where it was when we dipped down into the business cycle in terms of unemployment. In the business downturn of 1991 to 93, it took 26 months, 18 to 20, 26 months. In the business cycle that turned down in 2000 to 2002, it took 46 months. In the current business cycle, we're now over 50 months and nobody can see the time when we're going to get unemployment back down to the level it was in 2007. So each time it's getting longer, which tells you there's something structurally wrong inside the American economy. This is not somebody's policies in Washington. This is not something simple. This is something structurally wrong in the way we're working. And I think one of the things that's structurally wrong is that we shifted from the stakeholder capitalism of, of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to shareholder capitalism. Milton Friedman, the famous Nobel laureate in economics from the University of Chicago, wrote a book called Freedom uh, and Capitalism back in 1961. And in it he said, the sole mission of the CEO is max to maximize return to the shareholders of the corporation. So you don't worry about the other stakeholders. You might have to help them in order to get your stock up and to get your profits up. But your object and the only yardstick by which you should be judged is whether or not you're maximizing the return to shareholders. That's the change in business mindset. That's the change in corporate ethics that moved through America starting in the 1980s and spread in the 1990s and the 2000s. And it was reinforced by this whole idea of pay for performance, which is if you make the CEO and the top executive shareholders by granting them 500,000 shares, a million shares of the company's stock, they will think like the shareholders, and therefore they'll keep working to drive the stock price up. The problem was, and I don't have time to go into it, there are all kinds of ways in which hundreds of companies and hundreds of boards of directors cheated and manipulated that game so that even when the company wasn't doing well, 
<clears throat> and the shareholders were losing out, the corporate leaders were benefiting. The two classic examples are Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, two investment banks that went out of business uh, as we went into the downturn. Uh, they went out of business, the stockholders were left with nothing. The top five executives of those two investment banks got a total of $1.5 billion in bonuses and stock options in the final three years of leading those companies to absolute ruin. So that's the biggest single obvious disconnect between the idea of paper for performance and what actually happened. Lots of companies, of course, did do well. CEOs did do well, they got paid, but there isn't always a good connection between this idea of pay for performance and the actual performance of the company. So we went, moved to shareholder capitalism. And when you move to shareholder capitalism and your focus is on the stock price and profits, there's, a, there's an almost inevitable logic that you're gonna try to shut plants and freeze wages. We saw it, we see it in company after company. Last year, Caterpillar Tractor had $4.8 billion in profits. Biggest profit year they've ever had in the history of the company. And what did they do? They gave stock options to the CEOs and they, and they bought back some of the company's stock and ran up the stock price and they froze the wages of their workers. Now, under the old stockholder capitalism, you could say, okay, we can't afford to pay workers anymore and still be competitive. But if you end the year with $4.8 billion of profits, couldn't you say, we'll give half of that money to the stockholders and we'll give half of that money to the employees because both capital and labor contributed <coughs> to the success of the company during that year. That used to be the old idea. There are still some companies that do it. You may know people. There may be people sitting in the room tonight who represent companies like that, but they are the minority. That is not the prevailing ethic, that is not the prevailing belief or behavior of American uh, uh, business leaders today. So that's one of the reasons why we have this wedge in the economy, these wedge economics, where you have the growth in productivity over the last 30 or 40 years was 80%. The growth in average household income was 10%. And the main reason it grew at all was because more women worked more hours. Families were putting more hours into the workplace. They were not getting paid more for the amount of work that they were doing. Okay, so we have a disconnect between the growth and the productivity of the economy, the growth of the economy, and the profitability of American companies and the living standards of the middle class. If you look at just the last four years, the recovery, corporate profits have risen in the last four years, an average of 20.1% per year. 20, 20, 20, 20, 80% plus. The median household income during that period has risen 1.4% per year. 1.4, 1.4, less than 6%. Enormous gap, disconnect between the performance of the company and the living standards of average Americans. It's that disconnect that is tearing us apart financially, economically, and then it gets translated and pushed into the political arena, and, and then laws get passed that reinforce the inequalities. That's part of what's happened, um, is, is, this, is this wedge economics. The other thing that happened was there was a tremendous power shift. I talked to you before about the power of the middle class through all those movements, women, environmental, labor, civil rights. What happened was there was a backlash, there was a revolt of the bosses, business leaders, and it begins with Barry Goldwater in 1964, but it's mainly in the Sun Belt in that year. It takes about a decade later before you begin to see it nationally. The business leaders are starting to chafe at the power of political unions. They're very angry at the power of the consumers' movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, and they're pretty angry at the regulations that, believe it or not, Richard Nixon, a Republican president, imposed. Environmental Protection Agency, OSHA, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Mine Safety Board, Traffic Safety. Nixon put in more regulatory regimes to make, to control, to curb the excesses of American capitalism, believing in capitalism and thinking if it's fair, if it's run better, if it's regulated sensibly, it will actually be more successful. We'll have a more robust capital. This wasn't anti-capitalist legislation, at least not in Nixon's mind, uh, nor in the mind of Pat Moynihan and others who were advising him in the White House. Uh, but business hated it. Business leaders hated it. Ruckel's house told me stories, stories to the end of the evening, and you'll, you'll see a couple of them in the story, uh, book about his confrontations with American business leaders about environment. Uh, so you've got this backlash, and it's triggered by somebody you would never believe. And I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I was the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times in the late 70s, and I saw stuff happening there, and I'll tell you what I saw happening in a minute, but I had no idea what the cause was. The cause was 
that a fellow named Lewis Powell, who was about to be named by Nixon to the Supreme Court in 1972, and who was one of the premier corporate lawyers in Washington and all over the country, was complaining one day to some friends of his at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that business was getting a raw deal from government and was getting beaten around by all these populist movements coming from the country, and that business ought to fight back politically. And his friends in the Chamber of Commerce said, why don't you put that down? Write a lawyer's brief. Powell wrote what is now known historically as the Lewis Powell Memorandum of August 1971. It was a manifesto to corporate America. It was a call to arms. Powell was a Paul Revere to the corporate world. And what he said, and actually the text of it is in, is in the back of my book, uh, because I thought it was such an important document that most people have never heard of, that it was worth people having a chance to read it. Powell said American enterprise in 1971 was in mortal danger. Mortal danger. Now, you would have thought the communists were coming right over the hill. Uh, you, you could say they were on the defensive, they were taking the lick, uh, licking, they were getting hit about the chops, but they were hardly in mortal danger. But anyway, he thought they were in mortal danger. And he said, business, you've got to rally, you've got to organize, you've got to get into the political arena, you've got to go after your political enemies aggressively, fight them, pool your money. Think political action committees, campaign donations, lobbying, so on. You've got to pool your money and you've got to come up with a long-term game plan. Now, what is astonishing is Lewis Powell was as effective as Paul Revere. Not because he was so influential, but he was lighting a match the same way Paul Revere was. We were all, God, New Hampshire was in the lead, as I recall. Uh, down there, you know, fighting uh, the British, and, 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 and Revere was, was uh, awakening not just people in Lexington and Concord, but up here, you know, in Plymouth and in Portsmouth and so forth. Anyway, he said, you've got to do this. When Powell wrote, there was no business roundtable. I mean, anything to you all, Business Roundtable is the single most potent political force of corporate America in Washington today. It is so powerful, it is hard to imagine that it never existed at one point in American history. But in 1971, there was none. Four months after Powell wrote his memo, it was created. When Powell wrote his memo, there were 175 companies only, 175 companies that had offices in Washington. Within eight years before Reagan was elected, there were 2,425. There were 50,000 people working for business trade associations. There were 9,000 corporate lobbyists, registered corporate lobbyists. There are lots of other lobbyists who are registered, but these are registered, they can go up. 131, 130 to one for every member of Congress. 8,000 corporate PR people, unbelievable. There was an army, I call it Powell's Army. Well, I didn't even know Powell's Army existed when I was running the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, and nobody else did. Nobody in my bureau did, nobody in the Washington Post did, nobody in the Wall Street Journal did. In fact, most of them don't even know it today. Because I've given talks to Washington journalists, and I talked to one group of 50 with Jim Lehrer from the News Hour, and, and uh, um, who runs Face the Nation, uh, Mark Shields, only one out of about 50 reporters there had ever heard of the Powell Memo, okay? So it's astonishing. I can see somebody being astonished right back there. I was astonished too. Uh, unbelievable. Anyway, they go to work. Now, they go to work before you thought they went to work. Like everybody else, as a busy, focused, attentive New York Times reporter, I figured it was Reagan that really bent the curve of history, right? The pivotal Congress in the last 50 years was under Jimmy Carter with the Democrats in control of both houses of Congress. It is the Congress of 1978. So the Powell memo blew my mind, I didn't know about it, and then discovering this blew my mind. And I was both excited and embarrassed, excited to discover it, embarrassed to have to admit to myself I didn't know it at the time. Labor and the consumer movement thought they were going to get laws that would help them. They never got out of the Congress. No Consumer Protection Bureau, no laws for labor. What happens was the 401k plan gets written. Business goes on the offensive. 401k plan represents hundreds of billions of dollars being shifted, the cost of retirement being shifted from the corporate books to the pocketbooks and checkbooks of ordinary people. Hundreds of billions of dollars a year. The corporate bankruptcy law was changed. Migo, my eyes glaze over. Terribly complicated thing, but it shows up when a whole bunch of steel companies go bankrupt in, in the 1990s and a whole bunch of airlines go bankrupt in 2000. Why? Because the new law left management in control of the old company. The old management was left in control, and what they were able to do by going bankrupt was to rip up their contracts with labor unions and to write off all kinds of employee costs, which cost middle class workers 
billions of dollars in almost every one of those big bankruptcies that occurred. Uh, Wall Street bankers said, we can't loan to, uh, to people of poor risk unless we can charge higher interest rates. At that time, in 1978, there were state usury laws that put limits on the interest rates you could charge for mortgage loans, car loans, student loans, credit cards, whatever. They passed a law, it ended, it ended the usury laws, and it set up the subprime crisis, because the subprime crisis depended on being able to charge very high interest rates. Now, there were more changes that came under Reagan that were important, too, but it began there in 1978. Deregulation began, serious deregulation began in 1978, the trucking and the telecommunications industry. Carter wanted to increase corporate taxes to help balance the budget uh, by 2%, not much, just want to raise it by 2%. When the tax bill came back from Congress and the Powell Army got done with it, it was lowered by 2%. Um, Carter wanted to close loopholes for the wealthy in the tax system. The loopholes were never closed when it came back. The capital gains rate was dropped from 48% to 28%. Now that's in 1978. It's the single biggest drop in the capital gains rate, uh, in the tax rate, in the last 50 years. Now, who benefits from that? Everybody who invests who benefits from that. But you need to know that 50% of the capital gains in the stock market today are enjoyed by the top 1%. Okay, it shouldn't be any great surprise given some of the other things about the top 1%. So back then, there were a whole bunch of decisions. I talked to Arthur Levitt, who went to Williams College with me. He was then president of the American Stock Exchange. I said, Arthur, what do you get out of this session of Congress that's, that's sort of ending? And it was, there were two of them together. There was 77, 78, and then there was 79, 80, and it continued in the second Congress. And he said, well, we found out in business that if we get down and get in the political arena, we can get what we want. We can spend a few million dollars lobbying, and we can get all kinds of laws changed that really work for us. And if you look over time and see what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years, you can see it very clearly. I don't know if you remember, the maximum marginal tax rate under Dwight Eisenhower was what? Do you remember? 92%. Good for you. 92%. Unbelievable. If you're a multimillionaire and you made another million dollars, you've got to keep 80,000 and the government got 920,000. Somehow we still had an economy that grew, grew better than recently, right? We got dropped under Kennedy to 77%. And then it went all the way to Reagan, and then it dropped to 35%. It's bounced around since then, it's back up to around 40%. For the last decade, in the 2000s, the maximum marginal tax rate has been 35% under both Bush and Obama, until it just got kicked up this last January. We had the lowest national growth rate. If you go back to the Eisenhower-Kennedy period, when the maximum marginal tax rate was up there at 77 to 92%, we had growth rates yearly on the average of 3% or more. Sure, we had downturns, and then we had above 3%, but it averaged out 3%, 3 to 4%. So maximum marginal tax rates on personal taxes, maybe on corporate taxes it's different, but on personal taxes, it has no connection whatsoever to growth, despite what economists, journalists, and politicians tell you. There's just no connection. But you see the tax rates coming down over this period after the bosses revolt. And then you see the tax rate that everybody has to pay. Those fast food workers have to pay it, how little they make. The payroll tax that funds Social Security and Medicare, it gets doubled. So the tax rate at the bottom is going up. Percentage-wise, dramatically. And the tax rate at the top is coming down, percentage-wise, dramatically. The estate tax is coming down. The amount of what has to be taxed, the size of the estate is shrinking, and the amount of the tax is coming down. So the top 1 or 2% that are affected by the state tax are benefiting, and the minimum wage, which is the floor underneath the economy, is slowing down in its growth. And today, the minimum wage adjusted for inflation is equivalent to where it was in 19, below where it was, 25% below where it was in 1968. So you can go through policy after policy, and you can see that <clears throat> the, the boss's revolt that Arthur Levitt was talking about and that Lewis Powell helped to trigger has actually caused policies that are exacerbating and accelerating this huge gap in income that is occurring in the private sector. So you have it happening in the economy and being reinforced in the political system. And then on top of that, the people who have enormous wealth are the ones who are spending money in lobbying and in the political campaigns in order to get the policies they want extended even further. So we've got an unequal political system. And we've got a political system that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> We got to pull it, and you know why it doesn't work? There's some things that are obvious about it, but we don't think about it very much. We have now 
gerrymandered districts, so extensive, and by the way, you, have, you don't have much in New Hampshire. This is not, because you only have two districts. It's pretty hard to gerrymander here. But right next door in Massachusetts, you have it. And in Connecticut, you have it. It's the Democrats who are doing it down there. Uh, and where I used to live in Maryland, it's the Democrats who are doing it. But if you go to Pennsylvania and Michigan, and, uh, and Wisconsin and North Carolina and Texas, it's the Republicans who are doing it. Uh, I don't know if you know, but there were not only more people who voted for a Democrat for president in the last election, and more people voting for Democratic senators. So the Democrats actually gained seats in the Senate contrary to the expectations before the election, but more people voted for Democrats in the House races across the country. But the Republicans came out with a 33 vote majority in the House of Representatives which has something to do with the deadlock that we're having, and we've been having, and that we're gonna go on having, okay? The problem is that you've now got computer software, which is so sophisticated that they can literally draw district lines, and this is not just Congress, this is your state legislative districts as well. So closely they can tell you which house on the block ought to be in this district or the next district in order to maximize the gain for this party or that party. And part of what happens is the parties concede seats to the other party. If you're in Michigan and you're a Republican governor and a Republican uh, uh, legislature, you acknowledge that you're not gonna win the seats in central Detroit. There's not much of central Detroit left, but what there is left, you know, is largely minority and poor, and it's gonna go Democratic. So you say, okay, we'll give the Democrats the three seats in the center of Detroit, but we're gonna grab the suburbs and attach them to rural parts of the state, and we're gonna make sure those are Republican districts. Do you know that today, if you were to go talk to any smart political analyst in Washington, uh, the people who analyzed the 2014 congressional elections, they will tell you today they can predict the outcome in 90% of the districts, of the 435 districts in the House of Representatives. Why? Because they know those were designed as safe districts. There are only about 40 seats in the entire House of Representatives that are competitive in a House election. This happens in election year in and year out because this is the way things have been designed. Now what that means is the rest of the districts aren't competitive. It means that if people are happy with some president's policies or happy with some congressional policy, or perhaps unhappy as they might be today, there's not much they can do about it. The people who caused the shutdown in this last shutdown, and I'm doing political analysis here, I'm not trying to blame one party or another, but the people who caused the shutdown by and large came from districts that are so safe that it doesn't matter to them personally what the opinion polls say about who lost or who won from the shutdown. The public at large can say the Republicans are more to blame, but the Republicans from those safe districts go home to those districts, and those districts tell them, keep doing it, buddy, you're doing the right thing. Because those are safe districts constructed, so it'll be that way. Now, why should we care? Well, we should care, number one, because we're getting rid of We're not getting things done. But the other thing that's happening here is that the important political middle, the very source of compromise, which is the nature and the essence of American government. Our founding fathers created a system that required compromise in order to get things done. They gave some power to the House, some power to the Senate, some power to the White House, a little bit of power to the Supreme Court. They set it up so you had to compromise. So if you get a bunch of people who say, enough of them, who say, I'll never compromise, you're never gonna get anything done. And these gerrymandered districts help reinforce that because they've eliminated the middle. Why? If you live in a safe, safe district from your party, then you can either say, well, I'm gonna vote or I'm not gonna vote, but the party's gonna be all right. If you live in a safe district for the other party, after a while you're gonna say, I've been voting for years, and it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. These guys keep getting elected, or these people keep, still keep getting elected. So what happens is that people who are not activists, and particularly the people who are not haters, don't tend to show up. And the people who run the political campaigns know that what they need to do is to activate their base. And how do you activate your base? You get them so angry at the other side. It is all the negative campaign ads that you say you hate, that people say they hate, but in fact it actually motivates people. And some people are turned off and they don't go, but the people who are turned on, they go and they dominate the primary. The primary has now become the place where American elections are decided. And the primaries are getting more and more extreme in the candidates who run, in the campaigns that are being run, and the people who vote in, and the people who get elected. So guess what? You get extremes on both sides, and when they get to Washington, they can't talk to each other. 
because they come from districts that are deliberately set up to appeal to the extremes. So we need to do something about gerrymandering. We need to get that fixed in order to restore the integrity of American elections and to rebuild the American middle. We also maybe need to have what are called open primaries. Now you guys do that in the presidential election, right? You don't really have open elections, you have open primaries, you have a Republican and a Democrat, but you can go and vote in one or the other, particularly if you're an independent, isn't that right? And then, right. And then we change your... Yeah. You can go back, and, but the point, but a real open primary, which is now being experimented with in California and Washington State, which is very interesting. All candidates and all voters run in the same primary, and the top two go into the general election. Now, in most cases, it turns out to be a Democrat and a Republican, but sometimes you actually get two Democrats running against each other, and you get two Republicans running against each other. Now, why should you care? Think about it for a moment. If everybody's voting in the same primary, then you've got extreme voters on both sides voting, and you've got lots of moderate voters. So any candidate from either party has got to think about how am I going to put together the best plurality, and particularly in the general election, how am I going to put together a majority? Well, you can't put together a majority by appealing to the extremes. You've got to start to run a campaign that is generated more towards the center. And what happens is turnout is supposed to go up. Well, that's exactly what happened. Washington State turned all of its primaries over to two top two primaries in the 2008, uh, 2010 congressional elections. In every single one of the nine districts in Washington State, the turnout went up about 20%. 20% more people showed up than showed up in the combined primaries of the two separate primaries that they used to have. So the turnout was higher. When the turnout goes up, more moderate people, more independents are voting candidates have to behave differently. Now it's interesting, California did that just recently, just in 2010 for the 2012 election for the state legislature. There are already reports, it was a front page story in the New York Times literally three or four days ago, earlier this week, that said the California legislature is actually behaving differently from before. In the first place, the party lineup may not be different, but the kinds of people who are Democrats and Republicans in the California legislature are different than they were before. They're less extreme than they were before, and they're able to get more legislation passed. The record of this particular California legislature is better than it was for the last 10 years. And there's some other examples that I cite in my book that are historic, that show historically when you have open primaries and you have competitive races, and, and voters have a genuine choice every two years in the House and in the state legislature, that you begin to get a different caliber of politician elected, you get a different caliber of political debate, and you get something done in American democracy that we need. Now let me just end with a quote about, about America today, and where we are, and then listen to your questions. Um, we've got all these political problems. I haven't talked much about economic reforms, but there are a bunch of things we can do to improve the uh, the fairness of the American economy and then the effectiveness of the American economy. They're not my ideas. I looked around and I got some good ideas from other people, and lots of them supported by both Republicans and Democrats and sometimes both by management and labor. But let me leave you with this one thought from Louis Brandeis, a great Supreme Court Justice appointed to the court by Woodrow Wilson. He said this a century ago in 1916. We must make our choice. We may have democracy, or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. We may have democracy, or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to make a choice, and you all are part of it, and this isn't gonna change unless people like you, good people like you, in an organization called We the People, don't decide to get re-energized and re-engaged in civic activism in this country. You'd be interested to know, <laughs> by accident, I guess, or by good fortune, or serendipity, the last six words of my book are, we the people must take action. So we the people <laughs> must take action. Thank you very much. And I have three chapters on the offshoring of jobs in America, one about blue collar jobs, one about knowledge economy jobs, and one about the importing of foreign uh, knowledge workers uh, through H-1B visas. No, it's very important. Um, 
I, one of the things that, that, that I try to think about, what can we do about it now, NAFTA's there. We can not negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership stupidly and make the same kinds of mistakes that we made in NAFTA. There's no question about that. And Washington, and particularly the Obama administration, needs to hear from people about that. But one of the things we can do, basically, is to stop something that is just not very sensible, and that is the tax rate on American companies who move production overseas and make profits overseas is much, much lower than the tax rate is on companies that operate inside America. That's crazy. I don't know of any other country in the world that does that. The corporate tax rate in America is 35%. It is one of the highest in the world. Most American multinationals don't pay anything like that. In fact, from 2008 to 2010, we had 78 major companies. Goldman Sachs, General Electric, Pfizer, I could go on and rattle off a number of others, paid zero federal taxes, zero. Okay? Because they had so many write-offs, there were so many loopholes that they, they used. There are $1.2 trillion worth of tax loopholes for corporate America every year. So there are a lot of loopholes we could close. But the most important one to close that would help fix some of the problems that NAFTA has generated and other trade agreements would be to end this tax loophole for foreign profits. Which is just tax the profits, doesn't matter where they're made, worldwide. What goes on is, and at the moment there are $1.7 trillion in corporate profits sitting overseas today. They're sitting there. Why are they sitting there? They could either take that money and spend it to build more plants overseas, or they could repatriate it and bring it back. But if they bring it back, they have to pay the full tax rate. So what they do is they accumulate a whole lot of money, and then they get the lobby together that I was talking about, the Powell's Army lobby, and they go to Washington, and they say, look, we'll bring our profits back, and we'll generate jobs in America, but you've got to give us what they call a tax holiday, which is a lower tax rate. It was done, a trillion dollars was brought back in 2005 at a tax rate of 5.5% relative to the 35% paid you know, by the people who operate inside America. And then some economists went and tracked the money, and 92% of it went to shareholders and stock options for executives, and only 8% of it went into generating new jobs in America. So that's not a deal we can trust the next time it gets offered. We either got to ask for a higher tax rate, make a level tax rate all over the world, or find some way to really make sure that it generates jobs in America. We could say, okay, bring back the 1.7 trillion. How about in, how about investing that money? <clears throat> excuse me, in infrastructure improvements in America. Our ports, seaports, railroad lines, bridges, highways are terribly out of date and are actually costing us. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates. We've lost a trillion dollars of growth in America because our transportation system is so outdated. Okay, there's so many inefficiencies in it. So maybe we could make a deal there. There's smart things that smart people can do, but you've got to be able to sit down and talk to people without the kind of shouting we got going on in Washington today. Yeah. Uh, Washington delegation. Um, what are my thoughts about term limits for Washington uh, delegations? Um, I'm not a believer in term limits, and the reason I'm not is because what that does is it puts more power in the hands of congressional staff. Most members of Congress are really not worth much. <laughs> Maybe I should stop there, right? <laughs> but, but let me put it this way, they're not worth much in terms of what they can do except obstruct things, at least until they've been in Congress three or four years. They just don't know enough about how it works, and they're usually junior members of committees. The one thing they can do is block, and we've seen that. Um, and that means that people who go there who seriously want to do something about job creation, or about education, or about health care, or about child care, any of the issues, or the environment, whatever, whatever you want to talk about, they depend enormously on the staff they hire. So if you put term limits, and by the time you get a member of Congress useful, six or eight years into membership, they're out from term limits, and the new people come in, and once again, they're dependent on staff. So I think it's a chimera, I think it's a mirage, that people sort of think will fix things, but in fact, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, much of the, do you know that at the moment, 50% of the House Republican Caucus has been in the Congress less than three years? So if you think term limits would fix that problem, I think you gotta look at the problem over again. Let me go over here. It's way in the, well, way in the back, that gentleman there with all the stuff. Okay, we have a bunch, we have a bunch, I said, we the people must take action. So the question that my friend Ed Helm has in the back here is whether or not any of you are interested in taking action and, and there are issues that, 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 that strike you as needing attention and he's gonna pass around a sheet and you see whether or not you wanna sign on the sheet. Let me go back to somebody else. Yes, way in the back. All the way. Thank you. 
as I sing in the uh, basement of the church choir here, I hope I can be heard. <laughs> and Mr. Smith, who's been to Washington and back, I so much appreciate your book and everything you're trying to accomplish with it. And yet I'm struck by the fact that 10 to 12, near the end, you have 10 to 12 really fine, meaty, challenging recommendations of what's to be done. But at the very end of the book, there's only one paragraph entitled Politics. And I'm glad you elaborated more on this already. There's a whole chapter devoted to politics. I, I understand that. Oh. But sure. I'm having a little trouble way, following your logic. I want to address to the people here. Would Good. you like uh, a book next to this gentleman's fine book, which actually spells out what you can do as citizens to really take action as the prime, as prime leaders of we the people. Uh, there is such a book. I won't recognize my, my name, you won't remember it anyway. I don't have the reputation of Mr. Smith. But as an economist and a, somebody who spent 40 years in politics, I try to write a book for we the people and specify what strategy is needed to address the problems that he so well identifies. And the, the, lead of, the lead of the title is very simple. 1% plus 99% equals 100%. And unless that formula... I just wondered, is this a question? It's a question to... I just asked this question to the audience. Hey, come on, tell us the title of your book. Tell us the title of your book. Let's, let's get the pitch in. I mean, that's legit. But let us go on to somebody else, okay? Because it fits the theme of action that you took. Great. So what's the title of the book and what's your name? My name is Peter Burks, B-E-A-R-S-C. -E okay. But I, I, and the title of the book is? And the title of the book is? It's 1% plus 99% equals 100%. Thank you. All right, next question. Over here. Yes, sir. Uh, California recently changed the way they define districts so that it's a, done by a committee rather than simply the political party that's in control. Have you seen any of the uh, literature on that, and how do you feel well, about I, it? Well, I, I must have done a lousy job in what I was saying at the end of my talk. Because what I said was, in the New York Times, there was a story three or four days ago about how the California legislature was behaving differently because of the way they run the primaries and also the way they draw the legislative districts. I should have made that point more clearly than I did. And there's no question that it's affecting the way it's affecting who got elected, not necessarily the party breakdown, but the kind of people there, okay? And the behavior of the legislature. Now, it, you know, it's only a few months in the legislative session, so we can't know for sure that it, it's going to be a long-term impact, but the impact appears to be positive. There's good literature out there. Yes, uh, further in the back. There was a Supreme Court decision, Baker versus Carr, about redistricting. Right particularly affecting civil rights, right. why can't we see court challenges to gerrymandering? You know, i got to tell you, I wish the heck I knew the answer to that question because I have the same thing. It bugs the hell out of me. I do not understand. The idea was one citizen, one vote, and you can't fool with it. What happens is that the apportionment of the district is normally about 600,000 voters per district. And if you put 600,000 voters in a district, can you then claim that people have been disenfranchised? Now, in Baker versus Carr, there was a racial aspect to it. And so they said that redistricting was done to deprive black voters of the enfranchisement. So, so it, it was on that basis that the court made that decision. Uh, can you do it on the basis of urbanites versus rurals? Can you do it on the basis of party? Uh, it's been tough to move the court. Why you can't do it, I don't know. I would have thought some ingenious attorneys would have been able to come up with a challenge. I don't have an answer to your question. I would like to ask you one other thing. Why is it, when you, have, when you talk about the 1% and the 9, 99%, that the people who are most extreme <clears throat> are probably in the lower part of that 99%. You're right. They're losers. Well, I don't know if they're losers. Uh, I, I just, want, just, just to help me understand what you mean by losers, do you consider those 30-hour week fast food workers <coughs> losers? I consider those people who are protesting to be protesting. No, I just wonder what a loser is in your lexicon. Is it somebody who's working and not making enough money? 
somebody who doesn't seem to understand the way the system works. Well, let me tell you, that ought to include about 90% of the American population. Uh, I'm serious. I, 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 I'm serious. I want to, let me be the first to admit that my own understanding of how, and I spent 50 years as a reporter for a very good newspaper and working very diligently for public television. And I can tell you that I constantly had discoveries as I was writing this book. I think we all have a very inadequate understanding, almost all of us, maybe you don't, but almost all of us have a very inadequate understanding of how the system works. What we have is a whole lot of facts and a whole lot of dots. And we're not connecting the dots very well and putting them together. One of the nicest things said to me by anybody about my book was said to me by the deputy publisher of Random House. And he said, when I read your book, he said, I realized for years I'd been looking at the sky, politics being the sky or the economy being the sky, and all I saw was stars. And now after reading your book, I can see constellations. We're not going to be able to put things together unless we can see constellations. And that's hard work. And we don't have a lot of people who are doing a good job at it. I don't claim to be unique. But there may be two or three hundred people who are doing a good job telling people and putting it in books or magazine articles or newspapers to explain it to people. So I don't fault people for not knowing. But what we do have to do is to get to work, dig our teeth into it, and try. And it's particularly our job in the media. And frankly, I don't think we've done a very good job. So if a lot of people don't understand, I'm going to take part of the blame myself. Yes, ma'am, right back there. Do you think that corporate ownership of some of the large media outlets has something to do with that? Is there Did you all hear the question? No. I said the media has not done a good job. She's following up on that. Do I think that corporate ownership of the large media has played a role in it? Yes, I do, but I don't think that's the fundamental problem. I think the fundamental problem is that we're skimming across the surface of the news, that we're so focused, and, and this is partly what you all want. I mean, seriously, I, I don't see a lot of people in the audience for the news hour, which is trying to do a more serious job analyzing the news, is not high. If it were a larger audience, trust me, there'd be a whole lot of cable news that would shift and do that. Everybody's trying to chase, you know, a, a highly fragmented audience. And we all thought if we were going to get 84 cable channels, we'd suddenly get an explosion of really great news. Well, what we have is it's, you know, it's a mile wide and a centimeter deep, if that deep. Um, so I think part of it is, and the shrinking um, economics of the news business are terrible. I was just out at the Concord Monitor yesterday, and I walked through the city room. I met with a couple of people on the editorial board, and it broke my heart to see how many empty desks there were at the Concord Monitor. Now, and, and then I talked to a friend of mine who, who used to run the, the science group, producers and reporters for CNN. And I ran into him one day about two years ago, and he looked awful. I said, what happened? He said, we all just got fired. I said, what do you mean we all just got fired? He said, CNN just cut all six people in its science group. Now, that doesn't mean CNN is never going to cover a science story. You get American scientists winning the Nobel Prize and this, that. And the other thing, you get a report on climate change, you get a new drug coming out, it's going to be covered. But it's going to be covered by somebody who doesn't know anything about it. It's going to be covered by a general assignment reporter who all they can do as fast as they need to uh, can in a 24-7 news cycle is produce a story as quickly as they can. They're not going to, they don't have any sources. They can't go talk to somebody and say, what do you make of this discovery? What's the other side? What's the history of this? It's all that that goes back to this gentleman's question about why we don't understand things. All that context is critical. You only get that context from people who understand what's going on. I mean, before I went to Russia, I was lucky enough to get a Neiman Fellowship to go to Harvard. I studied the Russian language. When I got to Russia, I was one of four out of 22 American correspondents who spoke some Russian. The other 18 didn't have any Russian. How the hell do you cover Russia? At that point in the Cold War, the most important country to us in the world, <laughs> And the reporters for major news organizations don't speak the language. And that's when the news business was rich. So yes, if corporate people put the foot on the brakes and say, don't cover that story or make a big blow up of this that's advertised, but yes. But the biggest problem is that corporate owners say the news division has got to be a profit-making division. What does that mean? For television, it means the most eyeballs. What does that mean? It means sensational news. Don't give us boring, intelligent news that is not going to get us a lot of eyeballs. So the biggest problem is the profit motive. It's not 
is not the suppression of news. I'm not saying that's not a problem. Yes, it's a problem. We need to stand up and fight about it. But the biggest problem is the shrinking of the, of the dollar that's going into the news hole and corporations say, you got to make a profit in the news division, which means you've got to do something sensational. It's gotcha news. It's not real revelation. Anybody over here? Yes, ma'am. of our voting system, which seems to indicate a lot of gerrymandering in the voting system because it's electronic, it can be changed without detection, and very similar to what I'm hearing in today's news about the glitches in signing up for health care. Um, I'm wondering if you have actually highlighted that particular sensational news when we come around to the annual voting, because that's all we have. We have only our voice. <clears throat> but not only the vote. But not only the vote. You have the day after the vote, and for the next four years, you have activism. That's part of our problem. But let me ask you, I'm not quite getting you. I think you're, I think you're being a little euphemistic. Am I getting an elliptical question about vote suppression? Oh. Vote glitches and vote. Uh, you mean like hanging chads? Yeah. yeah. More, more. Oh, come on, tell me. Let's stop teasing me. Electric. Tell me what you mean. <laughs> what? Vote tampering. Uh -huh. Electronic. So come on, keep coming. Now, who are you talking about? Let's get it out. I'm a reporter. I, I want to know the facts. So vote tampering electronically. So that there's no there's no question that that's going on, okay, and there's so no. If we are if we are then suppressed in our vote, then how can we? Oh, you're not all. Wait a second. Wait a second. You you just jumped a million miles. You just jumped over the moon. Just say that there is vote tampering going on doesn't mean we're all being tampered. It means somebody's being tampered. It doesn't mean we're all being tampered. And you're starting to say, if we're all being tampered, why should we vote or how can we vote? Come on, that's, that's not logical. No, you're, take, people, you're taking... People are actually understanding that the government is very corrupt. And one of the most important base things is that our vote is corrupted. Okay, by whom? Here in New Hampshire? Uh, it has happened. And it's happened where? New Hampshire has a very good vote. Where has it happened in New Hampshire? I mean, I don't know New Hampshire. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time up here. There are people here who know. So where does it happen in New Hampshire? We're, we're, there are many people that have done many studies about what's happened in New Hampshire, but other states as well. Yeah. And what so have they concluded? Let's, let's look at the national elections that have occurred and the vote tampering that has gone on nationwide uh -huh. to make it appear that there are certain places that have voted certain ways. Yeah. Well, i got to tell you, ma'am, I'm a reporter, and i got to know an awful lot more facts about what you're talking about. In order, wait a second. In order to take your, your question in a way that I can answer it, my impression, and I haven't specialized in that, so if you ask me what have I done, I plead guilty. I haven't done anything particularly on that. There are a lot of other issues I have done something on. But my impression from reading people who are good, who follow Alexis closely, is that there's a far greater distortion, A, through gerrymandering itself, and B, through vote suppression. There's a tremendous problem with vote suppression um, in, in a number of states. And it's being done year in and year out. Um, the number of days people can vote, absentee ballots, people being disqualified. You know, I don't know whether or not that's what you're talking about, tampering. It sounds to me as though you're talking about people's votes not being counted. I mean, your, your language is really elliptical in terms of being very specific. Let me move on over here. Yes, sir. If you were redesigning the American tax system, what are the major changes you would make? Well, I'd, I'd, number one, I'd lower the corporate tax rate uh, by, say, 5%, so that the corporations in America were paying a lower rate, which would hopefully encourage them to generate some more jobs. I would close maybe half of the $1.2 trillion in loopholes in the corporate tax system so that we were stopping giveaways to, to mega agricultural corporations, to pharmaceutical corporations, to defense contractors, to the oil depletion allowances, that kind of stuff. I would do that. 
the second thing is, I would probably do what Warren Buffett suggested. I would have a millionaire surtax or a billionaire surtax on top of what we have now. Um, you know, people don't realize this. The tax take in America per capita is at its lowest level in 60 years. We, do, we, we didn't have an onerous tax system. That's not what we believe, that's not what our rhetoric is. But if you go look at the OECD, the 34 nation uh, group that studies the economics of the most advanced nations in the world, the United States tax take is the lo from individuals is the lowest, the third lowest in that group. Only Chile and Mexico are lower. So if you were worried about America becoming a banana republic in terms of taxes, we're there, okay? So I think there's things we, you know, we could do there in the personal tax system. But I think the first thing I would tackle would be the corporate tax system. I think we could do some very intelligent things that would both raise revenue and actually make the economy fairer and more competitive globally. Uh, and, and we can't get to that point. Yes, sir, you've been very patient. The, pol the political system is so stacked. What would you think? I mean, I'm trying to get people for the last two or three years of my activity to take responsibility for their votes. We are a representative democracy. And if you, take, if you don't take responsibility for what you've done, then we'll never change. What would you think of third parties, independent parties, or independent candidates, third party candidates, and giving them better access to the ballots, whether it's statewide or local election. There's a lot of talented people out there that don't get ballot access because the parties, have, you know, especially here in New Hampshire, we've got a Secretary of State who's got a lifetime appointment um, that are stacked. You don't get qualified people who may not want to join the parties. They want to be independents. And you said the statistic yourself, how many independents here are in New Hampshire. That's true, uh, including myself. Well, well, I don't want to cut you off, but we're getting late. But I've already given you my answer. I've already advocated already that you have an open top two primary, which is open to everybody. You don't have to be registered in any party to vote in an open primary like that. So I, I, I've I'm already, talking about the candidates themselves. I'm talking about candidates and voters. The same thing is true. The libertarian candidate, the free state candidate, the green candidate can run right along with the Democrats and the Republicans. They don't have to get any number of signatures. They're just on the ballot. Everybody's there. They're all on the ballot. The voters are all in there. That's the nature of that primary. It, it allows everybody to get in there together. And the top two then go on to the general election. Yes, sir, way back there. What do you think the uh, chances are that the plutocrats, the one percent, by the people in this room and in rooms like this. They aren't going to give up a damn penny unless we demand it and organize ourselves forcefully to get it done. Period. Yes, sir. Can you give us some encouraging words about how we overturn... I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of your question. Well, you, uh, the question is, can I give you some hope about overturning Citizen United? Is that right? Did I hear it correctly? Yeah. Um, well, there are now 16 states in which there have been either legislative action, resolutions, or some statement of the sentiment of the legislature that have called for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizen United. Now, you know, that's, uh, there's a long way to go, but 16 states is not nothing. Um, my hunch is, and I, this is a pure guess, and I don't like to do a lot of predicting. Uh, that's not the kind of reporter I am. I, I prefer to look at what's going on and try to analyze it and understand it. That's hard enough. But my sense is that if the Supreme Court makes a similar ruling in the McCutcheon case, which now raises a question about putting limits on the aggregate donations of individuals, if they make a similar ruling and say, no, uh, Congress can't do that, I think that could be the, the, the match that lights a fire under uh, some kind of constitutional movement to change, at least to empower Congress to regulate 
uh, campaign spending. I mean, we, we, we've got to get to that or this court is going to continue to punch holes in any kind of regulation that comes along. Uh, am I hopeful about it? It's a real tough, long hill, uphill battle. Remember that it has to pass both houses of Congress by a two-thirds majority, and you're talking about the incumbents voting down the system that got them there and is keeping them there. Uh, but it's only going to be popular pressure that's going to make that happen. I mean, people may have to go down by the hundreds and sit on the mall and sleep there and, 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 and get arrested and be replaced by thousands of others and so, until finally somebody in Congress says, you know, the public is really fed up with this. We better do something about it. I mean, I don't know what's going to have to happen, but that has happened in the past in American history and it has actually had an impact on Congress. But so I think it, back to this gentleman's question, it really does depend on whether or not people feel strongly enough and hopeful. It, 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 protest comes out of anger, but it also comes out of hope, the belief that we can actually make this country a better place. All right, we got to get down to the last couple of questions here, don't we? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, the electromotive force behind the immigration bill was vastly increasing H-1B visas, and both the Columbia Journalism and I believe put out articles saying these workers aren't needed. That's um, true. Any chance that's true. Can get stripped off in the house. It's an awful provision. I know I have a whole chapter on H-1B visa workers in this country. Do you know what H-1B visa? H-1B visa workers are imported workers, mostly from India, but also from the Philippines and occasionally from Russia and the Ukraine, other places around the world. They're college graduates. Uh, they hold jobs in the tech industry, uh, and. Um, the argument is from Microsoft and Intel and a lot of the tech companies is that we don't have enough Americans to fill these jobs. But in fact, the companies don't have to prove that there are no Americans to fill the jobs at the time they hire foreigners. So they hire foreigners at about one-tenth the cost that it would cost to hire Americans, and then they bring them here. I think the figure I quote about Microsoft at one point was that 38% of its workforce in the state of Washington in America is either H-1B holders or green card holders. Now, it is not true that we are not producing enough kids coming out of our colleges in the STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What's going on is that the brightest kids are being hired by Wall Street to do the algorithms that lie behind the derivatives, and they are paying so much more money than Microsoft and Intel uh, and, and Amazon and company are willing to pay that those kids are not available to the high-tech industry, so the high-tech industry says there's a shortage. It's a question of money. Would they pay them more? The kids are there. There have been several studies by the RAND, by Lehigh University, by University of California. I think it's uh, San Diego, but I'm not sure. But there have been several studies that show the output of, of, of graduates from American universities in the critical fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is adequate to fill the job needs if the employers are willing to pay enough money and foreign workers are not needed, except for a very small number. And we're into 95,000 of these visas every year, and they last for three years and can be renewed for another three years. So somebody, so we've got the equivalent of, of somewhere between 600,000 and a million of these workers in America. And the number that are probably actually needed as being unique talents in the world are probably a thousand, maybe several hundred. So it's radically out of whack. I think I really better stop, don't you think? Or you want to take you, can you do one more? Okay. This lady, oh, oh that, that lady right over there. Wow. Um, so I'm hoping to end this a bit on a high note, kind of. So we're talking about activism, and I'm, I've got my deck chair out, and I'm looking towards the future. Yep. Looking off the bat. Yep. So my question is, what did we learn from, um, um, the Occupy Wall Street movement and their lack of traction, and how can we organize future activism um, with lessons from there? That I'm suspicious that my friend Ed Helm planted that question. <laughs> That's the final question. Well, let me talk about Occupy because I think we learned some very important lessons. If you look at Occupy and compare it, interesting now, think of the word we're using to describe it. We're not using the word Wall Street. Not using the issue that they were protesting. We're using the word occupy, which is a very unusual word in American politics. So if you think of the PR, that PR is not great PR, okay? I met some, there's some good occupy people in the room tonight. 
And I don't think that's a great word. But the real problem with Occupy was, uh, the positive side of it was it changed America's discourse. Uh, my friend Ed Helm behind you is wearing a button that says 99%. The language of the 99% and the 1% is now embedded in American political thinking. It's in our consciousness. And we can thank Occupy for that. They, they embedded that idea that is absolutely critical. And lots of other things can come from that. But the problem with Occupy is a movement that would change America in any important ways was it didn't have leadership and it didn't have clear goals. If you went to the civil rights movement, you knew you had to talk to Martin Luther King, Andy Young, John Lewis, and there were identifiable leaders. And they literally sat down and they bargained with mayors and governors and senators and eventually with presidents, okay? So you need that kind of leadership that stands up and is counted and can speak for the movement. The second thing was they had very clear goals. In the civil rights movement, you know they wanted to drink from the same drinking fountains, they wanted to eat at the lunch counters, they wanted to ride at the front of the buses, they wanted to be able to go into the same hotels and restaurants, and on down the line. Very concrete, very specific demands. What did the Occupy Wall Street protesters stand for? Uh, a protest that Wall Street had, had ruined us all, taken us off the cliff, but what did they want to do about it? Did they want to shrink the size of the banks and make them so they weren't too big to fail? Did they want to limit the pay of the CEO and the top bank official? Did they want to impose a tax on stock transactions in Wall Street to raise tax money to fund food stamps or some other, to, to fund Obamacare or some other program, anything? We're not clear. So one of the things we learned from, from Occupy is that you have to have leadership, you have to have clear goals, and you have to hang in there, okay? Um, but then that question becomes a little bit more interesting and more complicated. Because if you look at the Tea Party, the Tea Party was a movement that began out there. But guess what happened? When it got started, some very smart people who had been involved in political campaigns with lots of money, the Koch brothers, Freedom Works, Tea Party Patriots, other people, um, Dick Armey, the former House Majority Leader under Newt Gingrich, they saw, wow, this is a wave we can ride. And if we get in there and help these people, we can coach them and seed into their movement some of our ideas, some of our candidates, and get people elected. So there was a coalition that began forming. It wasn't a simple grassroots movement. Question, so why didn't Common Cause, the AFL-CIO, Americans for Democratic Action, and on and on and on, on the center left say, hey, this Occupy thing has triggered something. It's touched the vein of public protest. You looked at the opinion polls after it came out, and the majority of the American people agreed with what Occupy was saying about the banks, so why didn't other people jump on it? So the lesson learned is, have leaders, have clear goals, find funders, build a network, go nationwide, pick a good issue, and keep pushing. We, the people, must take action. Thank you. will stick around. He'll be signing books in the back of the room by that staircase over there. And please, do come back on Monday night. And I want to let Hedrick Smith know we're going to make him um, a member of Red Sox Nation, even if he is a Detroit Tigers fan. Thank you, everybody.